NATO soldiers on another exercise in Europe's Baltic Sea region, this time in Lithuania. It's a show of force in an area which is seeing growing tensions between Russia and the West. And following Moscow's own military build-up in the Baltics, NATO is planning to station thousands more troops near Europe's borders with Russia, what some are describing as the biggest military expansion since the end of the Cold War. Sweden may not border Russia, but it's clearly nervous about Vladimir Putin's possible ambitions in nearby Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, all formerly ruled by the Soviet Union. It's led Stockholm to deploy a permanent military presence on its strategically important island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea. In 2014, a huge search by Sweden's navy failed to find a Russian submarine reported to have entered its territorial waters. But after that incident and several Russian violations of its airspace, Sweden's military budget was increased last year. Yet the government remains firmly opposed to joining NATO, preferring to keep its non-aligned status. Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, the Swedish Defence Minister, Peter Hultqvist, gives us his thoughts on security in the Baltic region, his concerns about Russia, and why, despite the regional tensions, he still believes Sweden should stay out of NATO. Minister, thank you very much indeed for talking to Al Jazeera. I want to begin with a question that concerns many people in your country. And that question is, is Russia a threat to Sweden? We we don't ever talk about threats in that way. We talk about realities and things that have have happened. And uh, the fact is that they have annexed Crimea. They um, have more of uh, military equipment today. They have more of uh, exercises, more complex exercises. Uh, open up bases and uh, they have more of a presence in our part of uh, the Bal- in Baltic Sea region and we also see more of intelligence activities so we can see that they're doing more things and that uh, is something we also have to react on in a way that we are not upgrading our military capabilities and uh, deepening our cooperation with other countries. Why is it such a concern to you, though, this build-up of the Russian military forces in the the Baltic areas? Why does it concern Sweden so much? I think it's a question for all the countries around the Baltic Sea area, because um, when they annexed Crimea, they also show that they are ready to use military power to fulfill political goals. And uh, it was against international law. And uh, that's very, very bad. And because of that, we also have worked with the European Union sanctions towards Russia. That's very important that we uphold the sanctions in the, in the future. And uh, I think that it's not, not only about Sweden, it's all the countries around the Baltic Sea area that see this new security environment and act from that position. Obviously huge concern in places like Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. If any of those Baltic countries were threatened or had some sort of attack by Russia, would Sweden respond? Would Sweden help? I will not speculate about that sort of scenarios because you never know what's happened in that specific situation. But what I can say that is that now different countries exercise together, info, give information to each other. We are members of the Cyber Centre in Tallinn, we are members of the Uh, security center in Riga. We do things all the time together and um, I think that when you create interoperability that also a signal to 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 the world around that that also can be something that can be used in a specific situation but uh, we try to maneuver in a way that we stabilize that we make stabilization in this area to have peace also in the future, but uh, we must hire the threshold together. Is it a sign of just how concerned you are that for the first time in, what, 10 years, you now have troops permanently stationed on the island of Gotland? Why did you take that decision? We, we have a, we, there is a new security environment and we have to behave from that position and we think it's necessary to have a battle group on the island of Gotland. And we have started with that one year before We have planned from the beginning. So we have a battle group there now and we are expanding it. We have more exercises on the island of Gotland. We have a a presence with our 
Air Force at the Visby Airport. We have also, also presence by our naval forces in that area. Gotland is, very, is a very important uh, strategic position. Because is, it, is it vulnerable, Gotland? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very important because if you control Gotland, you have control over the sea and the airspace connections to the Baltic states, for example. So uh, we think it's important to have this military group stationed there. What are your colleagues in the Baltic nations telling you about the possibility and their fears that they might be annexed in the same way that Crimea, as you mentioned, was annexed? Have they expressed those fears to you? Uh, we have talked a lot about this and, and uh, we have a contact all the time and uh, I have met also the Latvian Shod today, so we have talked about the situation. Uh, I think that uh, it's a way to handle this situation, to, to do things together, but I also think that the NATO presence in, in the Baltic states is a way to build up the threshold. So what, what we and the Balts and other countries try to do is to create stabilization and create a higher level of threshold to keep the peace also in the long run. You mentioned NATO there. Sweden and, of course, Finland are not members of NATO, but you've increased your cooperation with NATO. You're allowing NATO troops to exercise on Swedish land. Um, you know, you've, uh, you've been meeting, you, in fact, were at the NATO summit in Warsaw, which I think was the first time in many, many years, and you spoke there about the fact that Sweden was um, uh, a partner uh, to NATO. But if you're a partner to NATO, why aren't you a full member of NATO? Why aren't you a teammate of NATO, particularly given the tensions at the moment? We, we are in the NATO partnership since 1994, so we are not new there. And we have uh, got a lot of uh, knowledge from this cooperation with NATO in exercise and information sharing and that sort of things. It has a direct impact in a positive way of the Swedish military capability. So we, we have many plus effects of it as a nation. But um, we also see that Sweden and Finland, we are there we are geographically. And um, if we are going to join NATO, we also must see that we will have, have a higher level of tension in this area of Europe. And uh, Finland has a very long border towards Russia. And if Sweden join NATO, we make also a lot of pressure on Finland. So um, I think that uh, for NATO and for Sweden and for Finland, it's a good thing that we are non-allied and that, that we cooperate with other countries from that position and also work inside a NATO partnership for that position because the signal we give is that we do not want to do anything that can make a higher level of tension in this area, but we are not naive. So because of that, we, we invest more in more of military capability in our country, and I think Finland do the same, and deepening the cooperation with others. So is it the fear that by actually joining NATO, actually signing the paperwork, that you might provoke Russia? Because uh, the, one of the Russian ambassadors to Sweden has said that if uh, Sweden did join NATO, there would be, quote, Russian countermeasures. Is that one of the things that stops you from becoming a full member? This, this is not nothing. This is... Not... This is not a question of what Russia think. This is a question of what we think. We have lived up in this area for all, all the years. We have experience from the Second World War. We have experience from the Cold War. And we have that history. And we have also the, the history of how to balance in this situation. And I think that to work with the question of alignment to others the most important question is to have stabilization in the long run. And if Sweden and also Finland show that we want this stabilization, we don't make any big moves that change the security environment, then we show that we do not have any offensive ambitions. But we are not naive, so we upgrade our military capabilities and we cooperate deeper with other countries. And we now have a lot of bilateral uh, cooperation with others and we are also active in this NATO partnership. There are many members of the opposition, of course, who would like to see Sweden join NATO right now. You're in a coalition government uh, with the Green Party. The Green Party is totally opposed to the idea of NATO membership. Is it partly because you're in that coalition government that you wouldn't take the next step because the opposition are saying they would do so? 
No, that has nothing to do with the Green Party. I have explained our opinion and our view, and that's the position we have, and that's a position that has been built up during the years, and, uh, and uh, I think it's a question also of experience from the years that have gone and all the historical experiences, so this is nothing new. And um, I think that uh, the opposition, they have a wrong analysis of the situation. I think it's uh, much better for stability in the long run to work from a non-allied position, cooperate with others, hire the threshold, make interoperability, but uh, not go in in, in, any, in in NATO as an organization, and then change the Swedish security doctrine, because when you do that, you also create a new situation. Does that mean that Sweden sees itself as almost neutral in the Baltic area? We are not neutral because uh, we, we are a member of the European Union and you cannot be neutral if you are a member of the European Union. We are connected to all the obligations in the European Union and because of that we also have supported France when they wanted to ha get help after the terrorist attack in, in Paris. And we are ready to also go in and help others that are members of the European Union. And I think also that all these connections we build to others, that's also something that can be used if there is a crisis situation. But what you do in a crisis situation, you decide at that moment, and, and it's also connected to how, how is the view of the crisis. You don't know that before. So I am not ready to discuss any specific scenario. Then maybe we prepare for different sort of scenarios, but that's not a question. There's been so much focus, of course, on what's been happening in the Middle East recently, particularly in Syria. Has the focus moved away from what happened in Ukraine and what happened in Crimea? Has the world now ignored that? It seems to have sort of accepted the fact that, that Crimea was annexed and, and there have been sanctions on Russia. And that's it. It's, it's, it's left it alone, the subject. Uh, we have not left it alone. And um, I think that's very important to speak in a very clear way about uh, the annexation about Crimea, of Crimea and also speak about uh, the conflict that are ongoing every day in Ukraine. And um, for the Baltic states, for Finland, for Sweden, uh, this is realities every day, so we haven't forgot it. You haven't forgotten, but what about the rest of the world? I think um, also a lot of other countries uh, see this situation. And in Europe, we have sanctions towards Russia because of the annexation of Crimea. And that's a reality that are discussed from time to time and from month to month in the European Union. Discussed, the sanctions remain, but actually nothing has, has changed. Uh, Russia is not going to be pulling out of Crimea. It, it's happened, it's done now, isn't it? I think that uh, if, you know, if you have this sort of situation, you also must have a perspective that maybe questions is not immediately solved and uh, maybe it's necessary to uphold also a position in a long run to get a solution. But uh, So I cannot see any argument to, to withdraw the sanctions. The sanctions continue. Can anything else be done? I think that we have a Minsk agreement that must uh, be fulfilled. I think that uh, we also must have a discussion on the international arena about is it something to accept to, if a country annex another? Is that acceptable? The respect for international law must be something that are on the agenda all the time. We have also other examples around the world of, of a consequent brooking of international law. And it does seem that the acceptance is happening at the moment in the world. The acceptance has happened over Crimea. And you say, obviously, it shouldn't happen. The sovereignty of a country has been interfered with. Um, the UN Security Council obviously was powerless to do anything about it because Russia is a permanent member of that Security Council. Is there something fundamentally wrong with the way, for example, the UN is able to deal with things because of that veto power? I think that um, it's not easy to have any quick solutions of these uh, situations because um, if you search for quick solutions, you, you will be some sort of magician. I think that uh, you have to work with these difficult conflicts and these difficult situations in the long run. And uh, I think it's also a question of to have a driving force and a spirit 
to try to do something in, in realities and that's not an easy game because it's so much of, about power, about positioning, about uh, national interest, about uh, big countries uh, to, toward other countries and, and about balance in the world. So this is not easy things but if you not are clear about international rules then you know have no regulation that are valid. So you must keep on to, to be very clear that international rules have a meaning. It must be valid. And from a, from a, from, for Sweden, it's very important to be clear on that. And we will use our position now in the Security Council to talk about these things from time to time in a very clear way. I just want to talk a little bit about internal domestic issues for Sweden. You, like other European countries, have had Swedish citizens travel to places like uh, Syria or to Iraq to join ISIL in their fight. You introduce new laws to try to counter that. Are those laws working? Because the first case that came to court was actually thrown out. The charges were dismissed. How difficult is this proving to be? Yeah, this is difficult questions, but uh, what we have done from a principal view in the parliament now is to say that this is forbidden in Sweden. We, we do not accept that people go on this terrorist traveling and we, we, we see ISIS as an international threat, a terrorist organization that must, must be defeated, uh, no alternative. And we are also part of this coalition, we have troops there that uh, train and exercise Peshmerga, so we are a part of this. And um, if we not have been successful now in uh, court, we must see if we can do something more. Can we change the r rules in some way? Can we take this experience and see, can we be more effective? Because we really want to have, to punish these people because we think it's not acceptable to join terrorist organizations and we see ISIL as a very, very bad threat to the world. A bad threat to Europe, of course. What is the biggest threat to Europe at the moment? What is your biggest concern and fear for the future of Europe? I think it's so many things. <laughs> I cannot say one. We, we, have a, we have this balance question towards Russia. We have this annexion to Crimea. We have this uh, military tension. We have organized crime. We have terrorism. We have environmental questions, we have refugee questions, we have so many questions that we have to handle to, to make stabilization in this part of Europe and European Union is a very important instrument for handling these questions. So I think that um, to, to use European Union to try to solve all these sort of questions and make stability is very, very important. And I can also see that NATO or important part of this because it creates some sort of balance on the security and military uh, positions. What is the risk for Europe if the US does become more pro-Russia? If, if Donald Trump, as he has done in the past, has praised Vladimir Putin and said, you know, he's a man I can do business with, I admire his leadership. If Donald Trump moves in that direction, what is the danger for Europe? I think that um, what is well, the most important thing is that uh, all countries respect international law and it was against international law to make the annexation in Crimea. And that's very, it's a very basic principle and uh, from the Swedish government we are very clear on that position that international law must be respected. And, um, I think that is also something that is very important for the United States and the Obama administration has been a very big supporter and very important in this building of a strong transatlantic link between Europe and the United States and also to support the sanctions in the European Union. So I, I think that that's very important to have a value-based view of what you are doing in, in the international politics, because if you not have a value-based position, then you open up the door for, for different sorts of things that are, can be very, very negative. And uh, I also think it's important that uh, Russia not will be successful in uh, this uh, ambition to build a sphere of interests, that uh, so-called great powers have a right to have a sphere of interest, and that countries in this sphere of interest have to behave in a way that are pleasing the great power. 
uh, we don't like that sort of development. Um, so I think that um, this is a, a view that we have that it's very important to respect international law. And I have no ground to say that the United States will not do that in the future. But the interesting thing is you mention the sanctions on Russia because of the annexing of Crimea. The incoming Secretary of State has in the past pushed for those sanctions to be lifted. He said those sanctions against Russia should be lifted and he's now about to become the US's top diplomat. That's got to be alarming for... There is a process now in the United States when they will um, discuss the next Secretary for Foreign Affairs. and. Uh, I, yes, and he will be questioned during yes, that yes. process about and, and, uh, that. And we shall see afterwards, and um, if he will be elected, we, should, we, we have to see what is the governmental position from the US side at that time. I will not say anything before I know, and we have seen realities, because it's so easy to speculate about everything, and uh, maybe realities can be something else. You, of course, recently signed a new bilateral uh, agreement with the United States. Is that deal, is that agreement under threat now that we have President-elect Donald Trump? How concerned are you? No, I, th I don't think so, because this is uh, agreements between nations. Uh, and it's about uh, military exercises, interoperability, material research and international operations. Uh, we have also, during the, the, the years that have been gone, we have worked with these sort of, of, of things together. So. I think that we have upgraded in, in this agreement, but we have also done things like that before. So uh, we have developed the, the relationship, and, and I have no, no ground for any statements about concern or something. I, I think that we have this agreement, and I think it's valid. He's very unpredictable, though, isn't he? Yes, but uh, I think that if you have agreement between nations, it must also survive if you change president or government, because this is more long-going than you can change this by from one year to another. Is NATO itself, though, is NATO weakened, do you think, by the election of Donald Trump? We haven't seen uh, that uh, sort of development yet. We have seen some sort of questions that were created in the election campaign, but we haven't seen that yet. And. Uh, I think that the transatlantic link between Europe and the uh, United States is very important to make stability in uh, our part of the world and in Europe and towards what's happening in Russia. So I, my, my position is that it's very important for also the new administration in the United States to see the value of the transatlantic link to Europe and that sort of cooperation to, to fulfill some sort of balance in this situation we're now living in. Minister, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank no, you very thank much you so indeed. Much. It's been a pleasure.